Number three, Michael G. Bell. Boulder, Colorado is well known for its outdoor activities and mountains. It would also be an area that would undergo several killings in 10 days. The first one happened in Broomfield, a small town close to Boulder. 18-year-old William Lewis was working the night shift at the local Circle K Variety Store on August 15, 1990. During his shift, Lewis was shot three times. He died at the scene. The police believe that the motive behind the murder was a robbery. Less than a week later, on August 21st, transient Leslie Thomas, 36, was sleeping in his car near Boulder Canyon. Someone walked up to his car and had him step out. After frisking him, the assailant turned to his partner and told him they should dust Thomas. The assailant's partner disagreed and told him to return to the car. As the partner was walking away, the man shot Thomas in the chest and behind his right ear. Thomas did not survive. All was quiet until August 25th. In left Hand Canyon, Timothy Bendel, 22-year-old Michael Victor, 21-year-old Christopher Schilling, 20-year-old Patrick Dawkins, and 19-year-old Matthew Hickey were doing some target shooting. A man in a blue car pulled up to the area. As he approached them, he identified himself as an off-duty park ranger. The alleged ranger wrote down the serial numbers of their guns and began to escort the five down the road. As they walked, the man claiming to be the ranger began to shoot the men. Victor and Bendel survived, despite being shot several times. Hickey managed to escape the assailant with only an injured knee. Schilling and Dacius were both killed in the attack. It turned out that the blue car driven by the attacker was stolen from Canyon City, Colorado on August 6th and was found abandoned shortly after the attack. Unsure who was responsible for the shootings, an extensive manhunt of 100 police officers began, the biggest search in Boulder County in 15 years. Then a tip came in from 22-year-old Thomas Oliver. He said that 36-year-old Michael G. Bell, who had escaped from Four Mile Correction Center, a minimum security prison in Canyon City, was allegedly behind the murders. Oliver was an acquaintance of Bell's. Oliver said that he was with Bell when he went to the Circle K, but he denied his involvement in the shooting. Oliver said that Bell stayed with him in his trailer after the shooting at the Circle K. Oliver feared that Bell would kill him and another acquaintance, 23-year-old John B. Porter, which prompted him to tip the police. The police learned that Porter had been with Bell on the day that Thomas was murdered. Porter denied being involved in the murder. Both Oliver and Porter denied any involvement in the Left Hand Canyon incident. Oliver agreed to help the police arrest Bell. Oliver told Bell to meet him at the Boulder City Limits Bar. Bell agreed to meet and asked Oliver to provide a getaway car. When Bell arrived at the bar, the police were waiting inside the getaway car he intended to take. When Bell realized he was being set up, he tried to run away, but he was shot in the neck by police. Bell survived the shooting. The police recovered his 22 caliber handgun and 22 caliber pistol. Michael G. Bell was born around 1954 and raised in Galesburg, Illinois. After graduating high school, Bell spent much of his life behind bars. He developed a long criminal record in Illinois, including an attempted murder conviction in 1972. In 1988, he was sent to the Four Mile Correction Center in Canyon City for a 12 and a half year sentence for theft and check fraud. His wife Sandra visited him in prison on August 3, 1990. During the meeting, he told her of his intentions to escape. Bell directed his wife to where he would meet her near the prison. The following night, Sandra went to meet Bell, but he didn't show up. She returned on August 5th, and Bell was a no-show again. She claims he didn't go on August 6th, which was the night he had escaped. She learned about his escape later, and had tried to find him. Sandra Bell was charged with helping Bell escape from prison. In January 1991, she pleaded guilty to charges of helping Bell. It's unclear what sentence she received. Oliver and Porter took plea bargains. They pleaded guilty to being an accessory to a crime on charges of aggravated robbery in January 1991 and was sentenced to 20 years in prison. 
He would have finished his sentence in 2011. His current whereabouts are unknown. The details of Porter's plea agreement could not be found. Michael G. Bell accepted the plea deal to avoid the death penalty. He pleaded guilty to the four murders and received a life sentence without parole. He was given an additional 48 years for each attempted murder. At the time of this video, 69-year-old Michael G. Bell is serving his sentence at the Lima Correctional Facility in Lima, Colorado. Number 2. Alan Leger Miramichi in New Brunswick, Canada is a quaint and quiet city. It's on the banks of the Miramichi River. In the late 1980s, the city had a population of just over 6,000 people. Most citizens were considered friendly and trustworthy, so many people didn't even lock their doors. But in 1989, the people in the area were terrorized by a brutal killer. 75-year-old Annie Flam ran a grocery store in the area. She was well known and loved in the community. On May 29, 1989, an intruder entered her apartment above the store. He attacked Annie by beating her and sexually assaulting her. He then moved on to Annie's sister-in-law, Nina Flam, who lived in the apartment next to her, committing the same heinous act. Then he set the apartments on fire. The assailant thought he killed Nina, but she survived by faking her death. Her face was beaten beyond recognition and she suffered severe burns from the fire. When the police spoke with Nina, she told them the attacker had a chain around his midriff, suggesting he was an escaped inmate. The police noticed that the heinous attack on the flams was similar to another incident involving shopkeepers that happened three years earlier in June 1986. John and Mary Glendening were shopkeepers who lived in Black River, New Brunswick. Black River is about 175 miles from Miramichi. On June 21, 1986, three robbers broke into the Glendening shop. 66-year-old John and 61-year-old Mary Glendening, who lived above the shop, heard the commotion downstairs. The robbers were looking for a safe, and when they couldn't find it, they determined that John had moved it upstairs. They broke into the apartment and found John and Mary awake. The lead robber beat John and Mary until they lost consciousness. Once unconscious, the assailants dragged Mary down the stairs and sexually assaulted her. When they were finished, the men took the safe. When Mary regained consciousness, she crawled up the stairs to the apartment and called 911. 66-year-old John Glenn Denning died due to his injuries, but Mary survived. The empty safe was found later. The three men had gone away with about $45,000. Mary had seen the faces of the three attackers. She described them, and the police developed three suspects, 18-year-old Todd Machette, 19-year-old Scott Curtis, and the ringleader, 38-year-old Alan Legere. All three men had criminal records. Machette and Curtis were considered petty thieves. Legere was a career criminal with a criminal record dating back to his teens. He specialized in breaking and entering. Alan Laguerre was born on February 14, 1948, in Chatham Head, which was a rough neighborhood in the Miramichi area. Laguerre's mother rented out rooms in their home to make ends meet. Laguerre's father was one of the many lodgers, and he skipped town not long after she got pregnant. Growing up, Laguerre had a difficult relationship with his mother, who often brought men home. Signs of inappropriate behavior began to surface as Laguerre progressed through his childhood. He shared a room with his sister at home, prompting early sexual tendencies as he watched her change clothes. At school, his teachers were divided by his behavior. Some thought that Legere had potential, while others saw him as a violent troublemaker. Legere and his two accomplices were arrested a few weeks after the attack on the Glen Dennings. Thomasette and Scott Curtis both pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. They were sentenced to life without parole for 16 years. In January 1987, Legere was convicted of second-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years. Legere was incarcerated at the Atlantic Institution, a maximum security prison in renewed New Brunswick. Initially, he was a model prisoner, but he had no intention of staying in prison long term. 
In May 1989, Legere put his plan into action. Legere gave himself an ear infection using urine so that he would have to see a doctor. The correction officers accompanied Legere to his appointment at a hospital in Moncton, New Brunswick. What they didn't know was that Legere had broken off a piece of an antenna from his TV set and hid it in his rectum. At the hospital, Legere convinced the guards to let him use the washroom. In the washroom, he was alone, but handcuffed. Legere had made a handcuffed key and hid it in a cigar. He got the key out of the cigar and uncuffed himself. He then removed the TV antenna from its hiding location. When he left the washroom, the guards had their backs to him. He pressed the antenna into one of their backs and told them it was a weapon. The guards decided not to risk it and they unarmed themselves. Legere ran and the officers tried to use tear gas to stop him. But Legere managed to avoid the tear gas and he got out of the hospital. Legere went through the parking lot and hijacked a car occupied by Peggy Olive, an outpatient. Legere opened the car door and pushed her to the side. As he held the piece of antenna to her throat, he informed her that he was being held for murder. Olive did what Legere told her. He dropped her off unharmed and continued driving to an area he knew well in Moncton. That's where he ditched the car. The police searched extensively for Legere, but he was nowhere to be found. So the police suspected that he had killed Annie Flam. The police were already looking for Legere, but now they were on high alert. Over the next five months, there were several break-ins in the area. One man was shot in the back with a shotgun, and another couple was viciously beaten, but they all survived. On October 14, 1980, 45-year-old Linda Donnie and her 41-year-old sister, Donna Donnie, were at home in Newcastle, New Brunswick. In the middle of the night, an intruder broke into their home. He beat and raped both of them, and like the flames, he set their house on fire. A volunteer firefighter saw the fire and he alerted the fire department. When the investigators could access the house, they saw blood everywhere. The Dotty sisters had been beaten and strangled to death. 69-year-old Father James Smith was a parish priest at the Blessed Virgin Mary Church in Chatham Head. He was a kind and gentle man who was well liked in the community. He lived in the rectory next to the church. On November 16, 1989, he was expected for a prayer meeting, but he didn't show up. When he didn't answer the door, they peeked through one of the windows to see if he was inside. Through the window, they saw his dead body on the floor. There were signs of a struggle and violence in the house. The priest had been viciously beaten. He had cuts on his neck and chest, and his jaw was broken. The autopsy revealed that the killer had jumped on Father Smith's chest and separated his ribs from his sternum. At this point, the people in the area were panicking. The police strongly suspected that Alan Laguerre was behind the rash of murderers. The police ended up setting up roadblocks. On November 24, 1989, Laguerre was arrested at a roadblock. He was traveling in a car that he had hijacked. He surrendered without putting up a fight. It turned out that he had taken a train to Montreal, Quebec, but then he hijacked a car and drove it back to the Miramichi area. Over nine months, he had killed four people. Al Laguerre's trial began in August 1991. It lasted ten weeks. The jury found him guilty on all four counts of murder. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years. At the time of this video, Alan Laguerre is 75 years old. In 2021, he applied for supervised release, but he was denied. It's believed that he's incarcerated at the Edmonton Institution in Edmonton, Alberta. Number 1. Randy Greenewald and the Tyson Gang Marine Sergeant John Lyons was born on July 23, 1954 in Omaha, Nebraska. On August 6, 1978, John, his 23-year-old wife, Donelda, their 22-month-old son, Christopher, and their 15-year-old niece, Teresa Tyson, were traveling from Yuma, Arizona to Omaha, Nebraska. On their drive, they came across a black Lincoln Continental parked on the side of the road with two flat tires. 
John pulled over to stop. The family didn't know that in the car were two escaped murderers, Randy Greenewald and Gary Tyson, and Gary's three sons, 20-year-old Donald, 19-year-old Ricky, and 18-year-old Raymond. In June 1974, Randy Greenewald had pleaded guilty to murder. On January 15, 1974, 25-year-old Randy shot 36-year-old Stanley Edward Sandage to death as Sandage slept in his truck on the side of the interstate outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. He shot him so he and his brother James Greenewald could rob him. Randy and James were arrested the day after the murder while trying to use Sandage's credit card. The police found the murder weapon on them. Also, Sandage's ring and wallet were on them. Randy and his brother were both sentenced to life in prison. The police also suspected that Randy was involved in another murder that happened days earlier on January 12th. 42-year-old truck driver Henry A. Weber had been shot in the head at a rest stop in Mississippi County, Arkansas. When Randy was questioned, he admitted to killing Weber. He also confessed to killing another man in Colorado, but the details of that murder could not be found. Randy was supposed to be extradited to Arkansas to face trial for Weber's murder, but since he was already serving a life sentence, it was ultimately decided that he wouldn't go to trial. Gary Tyson had been serving a life sentence for murder. On October 18, 1967, Gary Tyson was taken from the Arizona State Prison to the Pinot County Courthouse in Florence, Arizona. At the courthouse, he was sentenced to one to two years of prison for embezzlement. As they were leaving the courthouse, 31-year-old Gary overpowered 65-year-old corrections officer James Steiner. Gary managed to get Steiner's 38 caliber handgun away from him. He then forced Steiner into the prison truck. A few hours later, the prison realized that Gary had escaped. About 19 hours after the escape, a couple reported that they had been carjacked by what appeared to be a prison escapee. The police tracked down Gary and a firefight ensued. Gary was eventually arrested and no one was hurt in the gun battle. Gary then led the police to the body of 65-year-old James Steiner. He had been shot three times in the chest with his own gun. Gary was convicted of the murder in March 1968. He was given two life sentences. On July 30, 1978, Gary's three sons visited him at the Arizona State Prison in Florence. They snuck in a sawed-off shotgun and some revolvers in a nice chest. They pulled out the guns and ordered the guards into the booth where Randy Greenewalt was working. Then they gave Randy a gun. They cut the lines for the phone and the alarms. Then they locked the guards in the supply closet and drove off in the Tyson's vehicle. Then they switched to the Lincoln Continental. Three days later, they got two flat tires outside of Yuma, and that's where John Lyons and his family found them. The five fugitives forced the family into the Lincoln and then drove them out to the desert. Randy and Gary shot 24-year-old John, 22-year-old Donelda, 22-month-old Christopher, and 15-year-old Teresa Tyson. Gary's sons did not take part in the shooting. After being left for dead, Teresa crawled away from the car, but ultimately bled to death in the desert. Her body was found five days after the rest of her family. The police learned that the ultimate destination of the gang was Mexico, so they set up roadblocks on roads heading towards Mexico. On August 11th, a van approached a blockade outside of Arizona at about 2.45 a.m. An officer flashed his lights and approached the vehicle. A shot was fired and it narrowly missed the officer. The van then barreled between the patrol cars and towards the next roadblock six miles away. At that roadblock, four deputies had their weapons drawn and were waiting for them. The five fugitives shot at them as they drove towards them. A shootout ensued. 20-year-old Donald, who had been driving the van, was shot in the head and killed. The van then slid off the road. Gary Tyson managed to run off while the others were arrested. He disappeared into the desert. It turned out that the van belonged to 24-year-old James Judge from Amarillo, Texas. James had been on his honeymoon in Denver, Colorado with his wife, 24-year-old Marjean Judge. The police presumed that the couple was dead. Eleven days after Randy Greenwald, Ricky Tyson, and Ray Tyson were arrested, the dead body of 42-year-old Gary Tyson was found in the desert. 
he had died of dehydration. During the 13 days that Gary Tyson and Randy Greenwald were on the lam, they had murdered six people. Months after the arrest, in November, the bodies of the judges were found buried in a remote campsite in Colorado. Randy Greenwald went to trial first in February 1979 for the murders of the Lyons and Teresa Tyson. Initially, the surviving Tyson brothers were going to testify against him as part of a plea deal, but then they refused to testify. Nevertheless, after deliberating for two and a half hours, 29-year-old Randy Greenwald was found guilty of the murders. He was sentenced to death. Ricky Tyson went to trial three days after Randy was convicted. After a week-long trial, he was found guilty of the four murders. Raymond Tyson's trial started a day after his brother's trial. He was also found guilty after a week-long trial. They were both sentenced to death. Since all three had been sentenced to death, they did not go to trial for the murders of the judges. The Tyson brothers appealed their convictions because they had not physically participated in the murders. Their father, Gary, and Randy Greenwald had done all the killing. They said they had no intention of killing anyone. Their appeal was denied twice. Then in May 1989, their death sentence was set aside. In July 1992, the brothers were sentenced to life without the chance of parole. On January 23, 1997, 47-year-old Randy Greenwald was executed via lethal injection. At the time of this video, Ricky and Ray Tyson are serving their sentences at ASPC Tucson in Tucson, Arizona. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.